Well, time now for Home Truths with John Peel. Hello and welcome to Home Truths. This week we experience, in as far as such a thing is possible, the sights and scents of Zanzibar in the 1860s, join a community in saying farewell to a beloved great aunt, hear from a woman who quite literally has no identity, and from a man who has so little sense of direction that he even manages to get lost in a pub. And thanks to you, dear listeners, a buttery mystery is solved. Maybe. To start in a positive, reassuring sort of way, there is good news from John Bromwich, who, you may remember, had lost his wallet in the Loire region of France, but was seen safely all the way home to Wolverhampton by a succession of Samaritans. The good news is that the wallet has been handed in at Orléans Station, and it's been then sent to the British Embassy in Paris, and that's supposed to be forwarding to me. So I just thought you'd like to know the sequel to the story. Thank you, John. Tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy, as the hymnist wrote in an early example of multiple product placement. Terry and Chris Hammond would probably be very pleased if their son Steve was in a position to travel with or without his wallet. In 1999, Steve, then aged 21, became severely ill with schizophrenia and life in the Hammond household changed dramatically. Terry and Chris had both worked for many years in mental health services, so were probably better prepared than most families might have been, but nevertheless were hard hit by the emotional upheaval of it all. Terry joined me from our Southampton studio and began by telling me what Steve had been like before he became ill. He was actually a really gentle lad. A bit of an introvert, if I'm you know, honest with you. He was mm -hmm. fairly introvert, but he was quite a sporty lad. Not an academic, but very practical kid. And you know, a very likeable kid. He had lots of friends and uh, your average child, really. He went to college, though. He went to college, yeah. He did painting and decorating, and uh, he was doing quite well at that. He was also quite a good artist, so he used to do painting and drawing, and also he was a, a pretty good footballer, too. Oh, right. That's something I'd love to have been, yeah. So, uh, yes. What were the first signs of his illness, then? He started to go to college late, and Steve had always been a, a child that was meticulous about time. He used to tell me off when I got into school late. But he started sleeping in, he started smoking heavy, and he, he started staying in his room, which was sort of really unusual for him. Mm. He started to sort of become a bit of a recluse. And I was saying to Steve, I really think you should go to the doctors, I think you're getting depressed. But then, it really all happened in, in a very short period, the actual psychosis, if you like, came out very quickly. I came home from work one day, sit and have my dinner and Steve looked me in the eye and said why have you rung the BBC and I said what do you mean Steve he said well they've been broadcasting that I'm a lazy bugger all day and uh, my heart fell I just then realized knew that he was actually a very seriously ill young man what, what do you think induced this uh, psychosis in the first place you said that he was smoking cannabis but uh... he was yeah I mean overall I mean one would probably describe Steve, and, and Steve described this maybe as a, as a sort of a vulnerable personality. He was always a very anxious child, but Steve has got no doubt about it that cannabis was the thing that triggered it off because mm. he was binging on it because mm. he thought it was safe and uh, he, he preferred it than alcohol, filling up his stomach with beer. And he says it was after an incident in, in a nightclub where he ran out of paper, so he ate a piece of the resin. He passed out, and when he woke up, he heard voices saying it's okay Steve you can get up now you're okay and and they were voices in his head and he's had them ever since so there's there's no doubt in, in my mind and in his mind that cannabis was the thing that triggered it off I mean you know you can't say it caused it because it's a very complex I mean the human brain's very complex but and he, you know he was potentially a vulnerable personality as there are I don't know something like about one in ten or so of us have got so-called vulnerable personalities so how did you and uh, his mum cope I just felt so, so sad for him. And both Chris and I were so sort of distressed to, to see oh, of you what was be. it. Yeah, it was. It was very, very, very hard, particularly before we went into hospital, which was about a month period. I mean, Steve basically was shouting and uh, he'd be pacing up in the middle of the night. Basically, you were dealing with a man who you know, lost complete control of his thoughts. Was he ever violent or No, aggressive? no, not at all. Where he was violent, he was violent with himself because he was frightened to death. He was banging on the door, bashing his head against the wall, screaming at the voices to go away. 
he was terrified at buses going by because he was convinced that the people were hearing him. You couldn't talk to him, you couldn't rationalise with him. I mean, as though and, he'd been uh, taken over by aliens, effectively. Well, exactly, and that's mm. what he believed. He was convinced that he'd been taken over by aliens. Oh, he read, he that's what he thought himself, wasn't it? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because he, he said to me, how else can people get in my head like they are? Mm. To, to show you how sort of powerful the voices are, when the doctor said to him, where do you think they were coming from? He said, well, I think they're probably coming from within my head. And the doctor said, well, how certainly they? It's all about 88%. He mm. said, well, what's the 12%? He said, well, it's the 12%. He said, he said it's the things my voices say. They, they're so clever sometimes, I could never ever think of them, things like that. <laughs> yes, that uh, must be yeah. a difficult one to sort out. I yeah. thought it Eventually, when he calmed down, his voices were sometimes quite nice to him, and he would say his voices are telling him jokes. And I used to say, well, perhaps, Steve, you're a comic genius. Yes, it's pass them on God's to us. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because I said, if they make you laugh as much as that. But he's slowly getting better on that basis, but occasionally they catch him out. Right. So um, is, is the condition treatable in any way at all? Oh, yes, very much so. And we went in, and he was on antipsychotics. He was in for about three months, which stabilised the brain chemistry. Hmm. And so when he came out, he was in a little bit more control of his thinking. But he still had the voices, and he still got them now. Mm. And like you know, we went to the theatre not, not that long ago, and you know, and I said, "You will control your voices, Steve." He said, "Oh yeah, absolutely." And as soon as the curtain opened, he, he made some remark, and he hadn't realised. He said, oh, "Dad, I'm going to have to go." He said, oh, like, uh, "My voices are, are playing me up a bit." So he's, he's, so he's aware that he's doing it, then. Very much so. Yeah, yeah. he wasn't at first. It mm. took two years. And it was cognitive therapy, it was talking therapies mm. that helped him to have insight and to realise that they weren't aliens. Mm. What we've been trying to do is obviously re-socialise him. I mean, the poor lad has completely lost his confidence. And, you know, I've got some really great friends and I've got, you know, a great daughter who sort of deliberately take him out and get him integrated to, to do what we need to do to rebuild him, basically, rebuild his confidence and self-esteem. You know, I take him down the pub and his voices, unfortunately, manifest in a way that he actually, he speaks his inner thoughts. Right. We went into a pub and uh, a, a really nice young girl sat down beside us and he looked at the young girl. He looked her straight in the eye and I, mean, I wouldn't say exactly what he did say, but to the effect that I would really like to make love to you. But he said it in a, a bit more uh, descriptive way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the young girl was obviously horrified. The uh, partner who was six foot six jumped up and was about to, to hit him and I mm. jumped in between and said I'm obviously sorry, Steve's had an accident he's got brain damage mm. <laughs> and uh, and they backed off and when I said to Lucky Steve... Lucky that they did because there's an awful lot of people that might not have uh, backed off Absolutely not, yeah. yeah. Poor old Steve he hadn't realised he'd said it because I said to him did you know what you just said? He said somebody no. else who said it. Yeah and he said he, he, he actually said yeah, he said I thought it mm. I said but you said it and he was mortified mm. he was absolutely mortified and, and uh, you mentioned your uh, your daughter and, and, and spoke in praise of her a while ago. I mean, how, how has it affected her? Well, I think, you know, at first she was just, you know, completely shocked by it. And she found it difficult because she was at college. And Steve was, you know, was this voice up in the attic continually. And sometimes it went on virtually 20, about 24 hours a day. She found it really hard studying and, and particularly bringing boyfriends back. And there was one who would be remain nameless or... Who <laughs> didn't come back? Uh, but uh, so she did find it hard to begin with. But you know, as soon as she understood the condition and understood what needed to be happened, Vix played her part along with other members of the family and friends to rebuild him. Basically, re so when you've got friends or acquaintances, people you've just met, perhaps coming round, presumably you feel an obligation to mm. not warn them about Steve, but to tell them about Steve. Anyway, but then of course you can always feel in a funny way that you're betraying yeah. them by doing that. Kind of, Absolutely. Know? it's You're really you're really caught there. Mm. I mean, you know, once I respect him as an individual, but I do in the main, and Steve is quite upfront about it. I mean, he's been four years now, and so we're... Mm. The one thing was a bit sad about it, that when he did actually realise that actually it was an illness, that it was an aliens, he did sort of say to me, am I really this ill, Dad, and do you think I'm going to be like this for the rest of my life? Um, What's and, the answer to that? Well, the answer is, is no, he won't. Um, the answer is that, Steve, you're going to learn to live with your condition and it will improve. Um, and, you know, and I'm totally and absolutely convinced that he will improve. He may not be cured, and, I, you know, and I've been up front with him about that. But I, I know for certain, because I've seen it de him develop over the four years, it's a very slow process, but slowly but surely 
he is managing his condition. It's a, you know, a bit like people who lose the use of their legs or you know, people with diabetes. Mm. You, know, you have to manage it and learn to live with it. And Obviously, mental illness is, is a bit more difficult because yes, it, yes. it affects you, it affects your whole being, it affects who you are. What sort of effect has this had on... It must have been difficult for you and Chris. What sort of an effect has it had on you as a couple? It's had a tremendous effect on us to, to begin with. I mean, our life has sort of been put on hold. I mean, we, we were in our early 50s and we were great looking forward to the kids flying the nest and uh, rediscovering ourselves again. And, uh, you know, and I used to joke with, with Victoria that, you know, I'm going to grab everything that Saga can throw at me, uh, you know. But in fact, that's all been put on hold. But on a practical level, it can be quite difficult because Steve smokes incessantly and we're non-smokers and he can sometimes be a little bit restless. And there's also that guilt when we do go yeah, yeah. away for a weekend that, you know, Steve's at home yeah, or Steve's should, with Victoria or with a friend. Yeah, yeah. But, we, you know, we have taken him away and you know, been abroad, uh, you know, a couple of times with, with him. But yeah. Yeah, it's a nightmare on the aeroplane because he, he's got to be without fags. And uh, yeah. we nearly got slung off one because he... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Went I off to, on one of them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, but we had stuck all patches all over him. He looked like that an accident. He had so many <laughs> patches over him. Terry Hammond, Terry and Chris obviously hope that given time and continuing support, Steve will eventually be able to live independently of them. If you want help with or advice on schizophrenia, you can call the BBC Action Line on 0800 044 044. To paraphrase the fast show, this week I've been mainly reading letters and emails we've received as a result of this. The reason we got in touch was that we, we were trying to find out if we are the oldest Anglo-German school exchange. On neither side have we heard of any school exchange that's older than ours. And um, we, just, we just wondered if we've, we've got the record. And if there are any others out there, any other school groups that are still exchanging, we'd, we'd love to hear from them. Well, I'd be surprised if we have any takers, but you never know. That was Ken Cook talking last week about the Anglo-German exchange that had begun in 1954 between his school in Doncaster and the school that his friend of the last 50 years, Heinz Wartenberg, had attended in Dortmund, followed by me rather foolishly throwing down a gauntlet of a sort. So, did any Home Truths listeners know of an exchange that had started earlier? Naturally, you did, in your hundreds. Not only were we inundated with letters and emails, but 0870010234 was rung off the hook too. My name's Jeff Bonnet, and I'm just ringing to say that uh, our school, Thames Valley Grammar School in Twickenham, is claiming the first uh, exchange visit with a German school in 1951. Sorry to disappoint you, Jeff. My name's Tony Barber, and I believe they were started by my school in 1949, as early as that. My name's Lucy Spearing. I was lying in bed last night listening to Ken Cook's story of his exchange trip to Germany. My name's Robert Russell. The school I went to is in Pontypool in South Wales, West Monmouth School for Boys. We went to Germany in Easter 1952. Adita came over and she stayed a month in our home in Devon. It was wonderful. She was tall and blonde and could do all sorts of interesting things, particularly making those great big German tort, which I'd never even seen before. My name is Pat Eels, and actually I had an exchange visit in Germany. I think it was in 1950, and then we got out of the train and I saw the Rhine and the sun rising over that river, and I've never experienced anything as moving before. I've seen the Rhine many times since, but never as it appeared on that first visit. Hello, my name is Helen Gibbons. I was head of German at Croydon High School in Selden, South Croydon. There'd been a connection with the Clara Schumann Gymnasium in Bonn since the late 40s. And for the first time I saw a wall bed. You know, we used to bring it down each day and I would sleep on this wall bed, quite new to me. This is Mike Lord. I was part of a party in 1954. And the other thing that remained with me and always has remained is the fact that Edita called her parents Mutti and Papa, and I thought this was so exotic and wonderful. And when I returned to my own home in Devon, for the first three or four weeks, I insisted on calling my own parents Mutti and Papa, because it sounded so worldly and exclusive. My name's Doreen Pepper. Just to say that I also exchanged with a German girl from Münster 51 years ago, and we are still in touch. I remained friends with Edita, 
until she died, unfortunately, at the age of 34. But her visit to Devon in those early years after the war was quite a wonderful experience for me. A great big German what? You may have been asking yourself, as I was. A tort, apparently. Not what the dictionary calls a civil wrong rising from an act or failure to act independently of any contract for which an action for personal injury or property damages may be brought, but more of a cake, really. Thank you to everyone who contacted us on this school exchange matter, especially the eager ex-pupils of Latimer School in West London, whose 1948 start date is the earliest post-Second World War one that we've encountered so far. Although Martin Cannon did email us this at home.truths at bbc.co.uk. I believe Anglo-German exchanges between Dagenham and Witten predate the Doncaster one. My brother Brian went on one immediately after the war in possibly 1947 or 48. They were organised by the local youth club, Kingsley Hall, and I went in 60 and 61. My family spoke no English, so given that I needed to eat, my German improved rapidly. Further improvements followed when I fell heavily for a girl called Aidit Amar Hulda Hildegard Muck. The fact that I can remember every one of her names is testimony to how hard I fell. She became an air hostess for Lufthansa, and I could never fly it without my heart fluttering. Martin Cannon. There was a curious period in the history of Radio 1 when I was the only married Radio 1 DJ who wasn't married to a European air hostess. Heady times. Actually, we stay with travel now, as it's time to hear about Yvonne Bird's great-great-aunt Elizabeth Smith, who, in 1863, left Thirsk in North Yorkshire to travel to India to marry her fiancé, Harry Jacob. Harry had left England four years earlier to work as a bookkeeper for a steam navigation company, and the couple hadn't seen each other once during those four years. Theirs was, as you would imagine, a happy reunion, and their life overseas was vividly captured in dozens of letters that Elizabeth wrote home to her family. It is these letters that Yvonne has recently unearthed. Bent beneath bundles of paper, Yvonne joined us from our Norwich studio and got underway by reading part of the letter that Harry had penned to Elizabeth's father, asking for Elizabeth's hand. I sit down to write to you with considerable diffidence. Under any ordinary circumstances, I am aware I ought to have asked for your consent before proposing to your daughter, but I trust you will take into consideration the rather peculiar nature of our acquaintanceship and the fact that I have never had the pleasure of seeing you, a fact which no one can regret more than I do. And then he goes on. I can't you... imagine any of uh, our children's partners <coughs> write, writing to me in quite that. No, no. They're more like, hey, fatty, you know. <laughs> yes, yes. It's charming, actually. I it think is. It's I think it's of... very nice. Yes. Nice. I mean, who could, you know, resist the appeal of that? <laughs> So what, did, did Elizabeth uh, write about the journey to India? Yes, she did, beautifully. She's um, a very lyrical and painterly sort of writer. Mm. Um, bear in mind that her, her father also was a good painter, quite well known locally in Yorkshire. Mm. And uh, she describes it lyrically, very, you know, and I thought, these letters are too good just to... Chuck away. Or yeah, you know. or to be seen by us, even. I imagine for her, it must have been fairly difficult, an unaccompanied uh, young woman. Certainly was. Halfway around the world. Well, yes, it took four weeks and uh, she was only 23 and um, she said about the journey that uh, everybody was very nice on board and no one has interfered with me. <laughs> but I get the feeling that if they had, they'd have had a slap round the face, you know. She was a very self-possessed young woman. Originally, a chaperone had been arranged, but it fell through. So yeah. I expect she said, look, Dad, I can go I by can myself. I can sort this one out. Yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> also, oh, on board, of course, a lot of young women went out hoping to marry. And uh, she said there are two or three young ladies going out to be married. And one of them, Miss Fricker, to a gentleman whom she has never seen. Just think of that. And the worst of it is that she's rather more than usually plain-looking. These girls frequently didn't know the person they were going to marry when they arrived. That's horrifying, isn't it? That's tough for all, all concerned. I That's right, yeah. yes. But she had met her prospective husband and she was determined to meet him in her cabin so that the crew wouldn't have the pleasure of seeing them. So how long did they stay in, in, in India then? 
just for a year, during which time they had a little girl, a baby. They did a lot of sightseeing and visiting, you know, where there was sort of tourism even in those days. And it, it was a reasonable life, actually. And, and where did they go after they'd had their year? They went to Zanzibar. I, I know nothing about Zanzibar at all, beyond the no. fact that it's, one, it's got such a, an evocative and exotic name oh. that you feel that it must be an exciting place. Well, but yeah, it was. Does she have any descriptions of Zanzibar? Yes, so I turn some pages. I bet, turn some pages, yes, <laughs> yes, by all means. She says, um, we've just this minute cast anchor in Zanzibar after a beautiful passage of 15 days. Uh, we like the appearance of the island extremely. It is very finely wooded and smells deliciously of spices as we sail along. But what did she make of day-to-day -day living in... Well, I think she quite liked that because, again, it was... It was just making It was very beautiful. Yeah. It was a very beautiful place and she really... You know, she says, about a mile from here, the country begins and is lovelier than you can imagine. I'm hopeless at being able to convey to you any idea of the delicious grass there is, the mass of coconut plum, palms and mangoes and orange, orange trees which shade the paths, all laden with their respective fruits and growing wild, of course. And then pineapples and other fruits and things. Um, the most, she must have encountered stuff that was unknown to the folks back home. I thought. Yes, I suppose she she did. She was. This is 1865, so um, that's the period. And and she met the Sultan of she Zanzibar. Went, yes, she did. Did she have anything to say about him? Nothing particular, no. But he did give her a boat, which was harboured off the coast. Well, I can't digest. Yeah, I've what? often wished to give complete strangers boats, but <laughs> yes. not, so the opportunity has not yet been presented to me. No, what a shame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she did meet the Sultan's sister, um, whom she describes very interestingly. She um, spoke a little Hindustani, which Elizabeth could also manage. So, mm. she, so she says we got on very well with her. She uh, was a most picturesque figure as she stood there. I wish you could have seen her. She must be very pretty indeed if one could see her without her mask, which hides all but eyes, mouth and chin. But she wouldn't remove it, although we asked her to. No Arab lady will. She was dressed in a crimson silk and striped silver tunic with trousers, but you could hardly see her dress for gold and jewels. Her nose, ears, arms, hands, legs, neck and head were literally laden with, I should think, as many as she could carry. For I took up one of her neck ornaments, which was hanging on the bedpost, and it must have weighed a pound, all solid gold. <laughs> Me, and so it? on, yes. And the matting was covered with Persian carpets and there was a, a small velvet pillow with red silk. So no sh no shortage of money? In no, the, no. Uh, and she gave them... Um, uh, breakfast with the Beckhams, really. That's about the sound of it. <laughs> yes, that's right. But in fact, she was a prisoner, really, this mm. poor girl. She couldn't take off her jewellery because... Well, and she just couldn't, so to mm. sleep on her forehead, you know, practically on this funny little cushion. And what was did she, did uh, Elizabeth ever show any signs of being homesick for dear old Blighty? Oh in yes, any of these letters? oh yes, she did. Yes, she she was constantly saying, "I wish you could see our dear baby, whom we think is the most clever baby in the world." We've all made that mistake. That's right. Know, yes, that, yes, know. and uh, she was sorry they couldn't see her. So uh, why did they decide eventually to leave Zanzibar? First of all, there were not many Europeans to socialise with. She was in constant fear of her baby being kidnapped. Um, it was hot. She had malaria. She thought she would die. And um, and then the last straw, when the baby nearly drowned. I can turn the pages and okay, read that yes, for you. Okay, yes, turn those pages. Yes. Oh, here we are. She says, uh, We were going ashore late the other evening to sleep out of the ship on account of a great many guns being expected to be fired very early next morning, saluting the Sultan on his going to Bombay, and we could not get a boat till nearly ten o'clock when it was pitch dark. So we took the little sleeping darling out of her cot, she's now about ten months old, and Harry carried her down the accommodation ladder and gave her into the hands of our Portuguese servant. He stood up on the thwarts of the boat to receive her, and had just turned round and was carefully stepping down when the boat gave a fearful lurch and he and the baby toppled backwards into the narrow black space of sea between the boat and the ship's side, leaving nothing but a brilliant bubbling mass of phosphorescent water to show where they had disappeared. 
<laughs> she could even... Well, she's even be poetic about the potential yes, loss of her child. Exactly, yes. Well, obviously the child survived. She did, it? yes, that's right. And she wrote to her mother and said, uh, um, Oh, mother, nobody else, I think, can understand what I felt when I heard her cry and found that she was not choked or half dead, mm. as I had fully expected. So, um... I think after that she thought, I can't stand Enough any of this. Enough. It's just too awful. Yvonne Bird. And you can see a photograph of Yvonne's great great aunt Elizabeth on our website at www.bbc.co.uk, stroke radio 4, stroke home truths. Last week, on hearing of listener Matthew Butts' attempts to persuade the machinery to accept his name when he attempted to log on to various websites, I stupidly muttered something to the effect that he should be grateful that he wasn't called Richard. Will I never learn? I'm ringing to complain about John's joke after the piece involving Matthew Butt. My name is, of course, Richard Butt. It could be worse. Well, it is. My middle name is Roger. My parents inadvertently named me after a sex act that's probably not mentionable on Saturday mornings on Radio 4. Certainly not. And is it necessary for me to add that you aren't the only listener to have contacted us about dodgy surnames? I, too, have enormous problems trying to register my surname as a username on various websites. Mine has two syllables, both of which are a little bit naughty. And get...